I love stories. Do you? My problem with stories is if I listen to one, either on TV or somewhere or reading in a book, I find it difficult to put it down. I want to know the end of that story. Stories we have grown up, especially those of us who grew up with stories as children. Didn't we love it? Sometimes we would ask our grandparents, tell us a story. And I always love stories of our older ones who tell us, my dad or mom, something in their past. We want to know stories. And then you have these beautiful fairy stories. We love fairy stories also, didn't you? And the fairy stories of the beauty and the beast. Did you like that story? I still love it. It's been a long time since I saw that, the Disney World production of that. What happens when the beast is kissed? Oh, he becomes this handsome prince. Or you have heard the story of the sleeping beauty, right? She's cursed to sleep until her true love wakes her up with a kiss. And there, a kiss brings out that beauty. I want to ask you a question. Have you been kissed by the gospel? I want to speak about a man in the New Testament whose name, maybe you could call him the kisser. Don't think of Judas right now. The word for kiss in the Greek, like remember greet each other with a holy kiss, is the word philema. And this man's name is very close to that. Now you can guess. That's right, Philemon. Turn in your Bibles to Paul's letter to Philemon, which is the last letter of Paul in your New Testament. The letters of Paul from Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, those nine letters are put together first, and then you have four letters, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus and Philemon, named to individuals, right? Remember? Why are they put in that order? Now, it's a very simple reason, not because of importance or chronology. They are in that order based on size. So the longer letters, first, the first nine letters to churches, and then the four letters. So you have the smallest one is Philemon. That's why it's at the end. It's just a postcard. Look in your Bible. It's just one page in your Bible, right? Or if you're looking into your devices, you don't know how many pages on your device. All right. It's just a short postcard of Paul. And yet, I want to share from this life what little we know from the life of this man, Philemon, a man who has been kissed by the gospel. The word Philemon is a very common Greco-Roman name in the Bible. And uh, in fact, in the Greco-Roman stories, there is a story of a man called Philemon who welcomed the gods and gave hospitality to them. But his name comes from the verb phileo, love. That is the name, the meaning of the uh, man. The name Philemon is, he's an affectionate man. There are three main characters in this letter. Who are they? Paul, Philemon, Onesimus. But these three characters revolve around or orbit around one main character. Who is that? Christ and the gospel. This whole little story that is given to us just in this form, in this letter, is beautiful. Now, we also have mentioned about a lady, a second verse, Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldiers. Aphia, probably wife of Philemon, and Archippus, probably his son, but we don't have to bet our life on that. Paul greets them and uh, wishes the whole church. And uh, they are somewhat wealthy people. They have slaves. Maybe 
more than one, at least one, because we know that Onesimus is a runaway slave from this home. And the church meets in their home. Only today we use the word church very often of a building. When shall I see you? I will see you at church at 5 p.m., which means at a building. But in the New Testament, the word church always refers to congregation. And the church meets usually in homes, homes of wealthy people, slightly larger buildings. And that's where the church, so there is a church meeting in their home. And maybe Philemon is like the elder or leader of this church. And Paul knows this man very well. You don't just write to a person who you don't know well and say, oh, by the way, I'm coming and I'm going to stay in your house. Keep the guest room ready. You do that only with people who you know pretty well, not with your Facebook friends, but your friends. And Paul knows him well. Probably it is through Paul's ministry somewhere that this man Philemon has come to know the Lord. Onesimus is mentioned. He's mentioned only twice in the New Testament. Here in verse 10 and in Colossians chapter 4 verse 9. In fact, when you look at Colossians carefully, and especially Colossians 4.9 and Colossians 4.17, you'll find some common names between the letter of Paul to the Colossians and in Philemon. That tells us that this church is located in the city of Colossae. So there are several house churches in Colossae, and one of them meets in Philemon's house. And Philemon has slaves, and this slave, Onesimus, has run away. By the way, if you are a slave, you can't just run away, okay? When you go and buy a cow, let's say, in the market, the cow cannot just run away when it feels like. Now, we are talking about humans here, but remember in the first century, slavery was practiced, a different kind of slavery. Slaves were living property. And when you pay money and get a slave, the slave can't just get up and run away. A runaway slave could be arrested, brought back, could be beaten badly, or even if the master wanted, get him killed. So, this man has run away. We don't know why. Well, I don't think I would like to be born a slave. I don't think any of you or any of us would be. But what do you do if you are born a slave, or you become a slave? You dream of the possibilities. I wish I could be free. So I can imagine this young man thinking, life is not too bad here, but you know what? I think life could be better for me if I just choose to run away and find a place somewhere. So what we don't know is this man, this slave ran away. You know, like what happens in India, many times children growing up in difficult situations in towns and villages, they think if we can just run away and go to Bombay, somehow we will find something to do and uh, survive because life is so bad here, things will be better. But what probably happened is this young man reaches Rome, most probably, and there he finds life is not as good as I thought. Maybe it was not so bad back at home. And we don't know how, but somehow he comes to know about Paul. Paul is in prison. And he finds Paul, and he knows who Paul is. Paul is his master's mentor. And his master loves Paul. And he's a good man. I have taken care of him when I was at home. So he goes and finds his master's friend. In those days, they call that a master's friend, the amicus domini, the friend of the master. And so he could put in a good word for me, maybe. So he goes and meets Paul, and somehow in those interactions, while Paul is in prison, remember, prison there would not have been like our prisons today, where you have to go through three gates to get into to see the prisoner. There is some way where your friends can come in there, bring you food and do things for you. And so he meets Paul, and in that interaction, Finally, Onesimus becomes a believer. And Paul says, he has become my son, a spiritual son, while in prison. So what does he do? Well, he's a slave. So he must be washing the clothes for Paul, maybe cooking some food and bringing him. And he's serving Paul in prison. Paul is enjoying that. 
But you know, just because your neighbor's cow came into your house, you don't say God has provided milk for our family. It has to go back to where it came from. So here is somebody else's slave. You cannot just keep him. And he knows even though he is my friend Philemon's slave, I can't keep him here without telling him. So he has to send him back. The gospel demands that he sends him back. So this beautiful letter, a personal letter, is a recommendation letter written from a Roman prison. Recommendations can make all the difference for many of us. Some of us will say it was the recommendation or a suggestion of a friend that today I am in this job or in this situation. I can look back and say it was a recommendation of my teacher, Gordon Fee, who got me into a nice program in a good school. You see, friends, recommendation shows you care for someone when you recommend somebody. And here is Paul for an ordinary young boy, a slave that too. Paul takes the time to write and say, listen, I'm sending him back. I want you to receive it. The word Onesimus, by the way, just means useful. It's not the kind of name you give to your children. You don't want to call your son useful. <laughs> but unfortunately, those are the kinds of names that were given to slaves. Because all you want from a slave is a useful slave. The kind of people who come and work in your homes. You want them to be good helpers, domestic help. And that's his name. But there are some very interesting word plays, and you're reading it in the Greek, which may not come through exactly in our translations, but let me just show you a couple of them. In verse 11, it says, Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful. Now, when Paul is writing this, he says, Formerly he was, the word for useless is the word akrestos. Just like in many languages, including Hindi, you sometimes use the word a uh, before another word, it becomes the opposite, like theist, a theist. So a uh, krestos is you, krestos is useful, a uh, krestos is not useful. But can you see a play in the words, in the sound? A uh, krestos sounds like a uh, Christos without Christ. And then the word for useful is eukrestos. Eu is the word for good. That's why you have eudicolon, eulogy, euphemism. You see? So he was without Christ in a sense. There is a pun there in the words. But now he has become beautiful. He has become good. He is useful to you. Onesimus has run away. Whether he has stolen something from the house, we are not so sure about. Let's not imagine that he has stolen something. But Paul says, look here, I know it's a loss to you. So if he owes you something, for whatever reason, put it on my account. And you know, Paul has a Middle East Express card. <laughs> no, he doesn't. He has something better. Then he tells him, by the way, just to remind you, you owe me your life. <laughs> Meaning, your bank account is mine. So take it from my bank account, which is yours. It's amazing. What does the gospel do? It changes the way we look at life. When the gospel comes, we don't talk about, you know, this is my money. And when I give 10% to God, I've finished my duty with God. The rest is mine. Who told us that? And so, this is beautiful. There is a lot here to learn. What happens if we become believers in Jesus? What happens when the gospel embraces us? What happens when the Father comes and kisses us? When we are kissed by the gospel, what happens? Here we have a beautiful glimpse into what happens. And so, Paul is sending this boy back, and you read Colossians along with Tychicus. Tychicus is the carrier of that letter to Colossae, and along with that letter goes this personal letter to secure forgiveness and ensure that this slave, a former slave, is taken back into the household and the church, not just the household, but also as a church, as a Christian brother. But you know, it's not an easy letter to write. Technically, 
when somebody's cow comes and you enjoy that cow for a few weeks, <laughs> then you decide now I have to send the cow back. Then you write a letter. It's a little delicate letter, right? Thank you, I enjoyed your cow for the last so many weeks. Now I'm sending him back because I must, otherwise, you know, I could be in trouble. No. So Paul writes this letter and he says, I'm not going to command you, I'm going to ask you in love. And he just tells him, by the way, I'm an old man. I don't know what old man at that age meant. I don't think it was 80s. Probably Paul was in his 60s or something. And he says, by the way, just think of that you loaned him to me. Loaned him? Without his, him knowing it? Yeah, yeah, think of it like that. Think that you loaned him to me because you always want to help me, right? So he has already helped me. But I am sending him back. Of course, you are welcome to send him back now if you want to. But this time you will do it knowingly. You see the tone and the relationship that is expressed in this letter. I want you to see something else that is very beautiful. Look at verse 7. What kind of man is this man Philemon? Verse 7 he says, Your love, brother, has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, what do you do? You refresh the... Now, if you have a King James Bible by any chance, you will find a very interesting word there. You refresh the bowels of God's people. Now the Greek has another word for heart, is cardia. But it's not the word cardia here. So even though my translation will say hearts, King James says bowels. Even when we talk about heart, don't we sometimes say, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. So the heart is not good enough. You have to go down a little more and say bottom of my heart. But really that's not deep enough. For the Greco-Roman world, the, your emotion is deep when it below your heart, it is in your intestines. And the word for that is plankna. That's the word for guts or bowels, as the King James calls it. Very interesting. You refresh the bowels of God's people. Now, I know we don't use that English today. But don't we say, I have a gut feeling? Where do we feel fear or nervousness? We say we have butterflies in the stomach. So that's what Paul is saying. You, Philemon, you are such a person that when people come to you and you take care of them, they feel good deep within. You refresh the guts of God's people. Amazing. And then in verse 12, there is does something very interesting. Paul says, I am sending him. Who is he going to send? Onesimus. Who is my very... Again, you have the word heart there. It's not heart. He said, I am sending you my guts. My splankna. Imagine. Do you talk about another person who is a slave boy as your guts? Does that kind of emotion, affection come into relationship in the church? Well, that's what happens when you're kissed by the gospel. I'm sending you my guts. And then look at verse 20, he says, Now I have this request of you, refresh my... That's the word there again, not cardia. Refresh my guts in Christ Jesus. What is he saying? Philemon, when you read that letter and you look, that boy Onesimus is standing there. His head is down. This is his boss, his master. He ran away. He's down. He's standing like that. What should Philemon see when he looks up? Not Onesimus, but Paul's guts standing there. And what do you do with Paul's guts? Beat him up. It's amazing what the way Paul is speaking here is, when I'm sending him, he's my son, he's my very being. Does Philemon have a choice in how he treats him? Does he have a choice except to welcome him, embrace him into the family? That's what happens when you're kissed by the gospel. Hallelujah. The gospel changes 
everything. There is a tradition, though, very difficult to completely be certain about, that there was a bishop of Ephesus who was also called Onesimus, of whom the church father Ignatius writes in his letter to the Ephesians, and he praises this man, the bishop of Ephesus, Onesimus, for his love, and for, says, he tells people, you must imitate this man, Onesimus. Some people think that Onesimus is this Onesimus, who later became a leader in the church. Well, we cannot be sure about that. However, it's a very interesting passage because later on in the history of the church, the church struggled with slavery. And some people, some believers, fought for abolition against slavery. And then there were those who used this story to say, remember Paul sent back the slave, so he was not against slavery. So how we use scripture is always a challenge, friends. Sometimes we say, where do you find that? If you say something, oh, show me in the Bible. Now I can't show you many things like brushing your teeth in the Bible. So in that sense, and most of the Bible is what we call the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, the Bible of Jesus, which we don't follow in that sense. Listen to me carefully. Don't quote me out of context. In a sense, we don't follow the Bible. We follow Jesus today. And the Bible helps us to follow Jesus. We don't look for a verse to support whatever we do. That's a bad way of using scripture. The whole scripture teaches us how to follow Jesus. It guides us. The word Torah does not mean law as points, what to do and what not to do. The word Torah means guidance. So scripture guides us. And so this beautiful letter for many people later on, especially in the history of America, was a guidance of how to work at against slavery and for abolition. It's a beautiful, beautiful letter. But it's very crucial. When this letter reaches Philemon, what is he going to do? Because if he chooses not to pardon the slave, the gospel is at stake. There is no future without forgiveness. And that's the title to a book that a very famous person wrote. Anyone? Desmond Tutu. There is no future without forgiveness. And one of the things that the gospel does is helps us to receive forgiveness and give forgiveness. There is no future in our relationships if there is no forgiveness. And unless there is forgiveness, there is no future. And unless you and I receive, first of all, God's forgiveness and share that forgiveness, there is no future. The gospel is at stake here, friends. The gospel is at stake. Because the gospel changes everything. Remember, in the beautiful parable of the loving father, that's a better title than the traditional prodigal son. The father runs to his son and falls on his neck, it says. He falls on his neck. <laughs> That's the word, he embraces him and kisses him. Welcomes him as a dead son, who, but he makes him alive and throws a party. That's what the Lord wants to do for us, for every one of us. I don't know whether in this congregation there is anyone who has not yet allowed the Lord to fall on your neck and kiss you. If by any chance there is even one person, my dear brother, my dear sister, let me tell you, God is waiting to fall on your neck and kiss you. Wherever you are, whatever you are, you can never be too far, you can never go deeper in sin, God will come there and this Father will fall on your neck and kiss you. Three things I want to say happens in our life when you are kissed by the gospel. Number one, we see ourselves and God differently. We see ourselves and God differently. Most of us struggle 
with ourselves. <laughs> we struggle with ourselves. We don't like ourselves in many, many ways. We wish there were some differences. That's why, you know, now with our selfie culture, you take a picture and then you have so many filters. Eh, not that picture. Don't, put, don't post that picture. I don't look nice there. But we begin to see ourselves differently and God differently when we are embraced by the loving Father. And the way we see ourselves is often influenced by the way others see us. So that's why when we post something on social media, we want to see how many likes. And if you have more likes, we say, we say you know how many likes I got? Or when some of us preachers post something, we want to know how many views that had. And we begin to measure ourselves with how others see us. But the gospel changes the way we see God. That's why it changes the way we see ourselves. If this God can come and love me the way I am, then I am so precious to God. The gospel changes the way we see ourselves. When we know we are loved by God, that helps us to love ourselves. Remember Peter, after his painful denials of Jesus, he's struggling to look up at the resurrected Jesus. John chapter 21. And then Jesus turns to Peter and says, Peter, and he looks up at Jesus, son of John, do you love me? Of course, what this means is that Jesus clearly loved Peter. He's smiling. He says, I love you, man, but do you love me? Are you able to love me? I love you. And Peter says, Lord, I do. And Jesus lovingly reinstates him. Three times he asked that question and three times Jesus reinstates him. He's a completely different man. And now, when he knew that Jesus still loved him, he was ready to give away his life for Jesus. It's only when you and I know that God really loves us. Sometimes we ask that question because of our struggles in life and we ask, does God really love me? Then why didn't he answer my prayers when I prayed so many times? But once we know God really loves us, how do we know God really loves us? How much do you love me, God? And God says, this much. And once we know that God loves me this much in Christ Jesus, then we are beginning to accept ourselves and say, it's okay, I see myself differently. I love myself. I love because I'm loved by God. The gospel changes everything when we know we are loved by God. What happens, friends, when that love of God comes in, the gospel changes everything. The second thing we learn in this story, we relate with others differently. Why? Because now we see others from that gospel perspective. Remember, Paul calls him a fellow worker. He considers him a partner in the work of the gospel. And he knows that this man, Philemon, loves God's people. My guess is that he is so generous with what God has given to him that he is a great blessing to many, many people in the church. That's why it says in verse 7, he refreshes the splunk, now the guts of God's people by his exceptional hospitality and generosity. Now, Paul says, do that for your former slave, but receive him as a brother. Hmm. Your slave, now you treat him like your brother. That gospel changes everything. When we look at other people differently, our Father God is waiting for God's people to begin to look at other people differently. Unfortunately, it takes time. For many, many of us, it doesn't go deep down till it changes the way we look at people of other languages. 
and in our caste-ridden society, including Christians who think in caste lines, we are not able to see another person from another caste or another language group or another situation very differently. Oh, but the gospel should change. Even where there was somebody who was your former slave, you have to now look at that person as your brother. That's what the gospel does. Like Philemon, we seek others with all that we have. We seek to serve others with the, in different ways. When Paul writes to the Thessalonians, you have been taught by God to love one another. God teaches us to love one another in a different way. It's so tragic when we find Christians talking about others from another community, another language group, another caste group, in a somehow you don't respect them in the same way. But the gospel must change the way we look and see others. Thirdly, we see that the gospel helps us to re-evaluate our mission in life. You see, no longer do we take our agenda from the world, we take our agenda from the Word of God that has been revealed to us in Scripture. We growing up into maturity and therefore as mature people bringing forth fruit, fruit going beyond what we are doing and God making us a blessing to a greater number of people wherever the Lord takes us. And that is the message in Scripture. Especially, for example, in the Gospel of Luke, the way he structures those two volumes, Luke 1 and Luke 2, which is the book of Acts. And in Luke 1, you see Jesus is moving, 951, he's moving from Galilee towards Jerusalem. The whole movement is towards Jerusalem. It starts in 951 and he reaches in 1928. And then in the book of Acts, we have the story starting in Jerusalem in the power of the Holy Spirit moving towards the end of the world. And today, the same way the gospel must go from everywhere to everywhere. There is no fixed Jerusalem, Antioch, anywhere. Wherever we are, God has called you to go out from here to wherever he takes you in the power of the Holy Spirit. And every one of us here can play a very significant part in that great mission movement of your church. We reevaluate our mission in life. That's the third thing that happens. Living as if not. Let me read you a very interesting passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 29 to 31. Let me read for you. You can listen. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. Okay? From now on, those who are married should live as if they were not. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. So you buy your iPhone but it's not yours to keep. Those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. And then he gives you the reason for it. For this world in its present form is passing away. It's passing away. All the things that we get excited, you buy something, you're so happy with that, it's passing away. Living as if not, so we have a new Mission in life, we re-evaluate. Re we don't hold on tightly, we hold on lightly to whatever. Everything, including family. Francis Chan, this wonderful preacher, he was speaking at a Focus on the Family convention. It's a big organization called Focus on the Family. And you know what he said in the convention of the Focus on the Family? He said, the best thing you can do for your family is don't focus on the family. Of course, what he was saying is, focus on God. Focus on God's things. Yes, your family is one of the things that orbits around 
God. Focus on the kingdom, seeking to live the values of the kingdom which has come now and is still to come in all its fullness. The world says, whoever dies with the greatest toys and things is a winner. That's what the world says. If you die with a lot of toys, meaning things, then you are a successful person. And the kingdom says, blessed are the poor. It is more blessed to give than to receive. The famous theologian, German theologian Helmut Thielicke once said, our checkbooks have more to do with heaven and hell than our hymn books. So it's not what we sang in worship that will ultimately decide what really is happening in our life. It is how we deal with our money. The same pastor Francis Chan, who was pastor of a mega church, God led him to leave the church and downsize. He was living in a thriving church in Los Angeles and he moved to a smaller house in a different area and started building house churches. Missionaries who came to India so that you and I can be sitting here today in church. Who were the first Protestant missionaries to India? First Protestant missionary to India. Any guess? 1706, 300 years ago, two German missionaries, two young boys came here, gave their life. Bartholomew Siegenborg and Henrik Lutscho. They came to Tamil Nadu. That's why the first language, Indian language in which the Bible was translated was Tamil. Changed the history of India. And today you know how there, from there, Protestant missions began and, and then others came. William Carey, 1793 and others gave their life. Let me just have time to mention the, another one, Henry Martin. A brilliant scholar from Cambridge, young man, but he had a heart for the Muslims. He came to India, he came to Iran, and during his strenuous efforts to translate the Bible for Muslims, going back home, he died at the age of 39. And he would say this, the spirit of Christ is the spirit of missions. And the nearer we get to him, the more intensely missionary we must become. But that's what Henry Martin said. The spirit of Christ is the spirit of missions. When the gospel comes into our life, it changes the way we re-evaluate our mission in life. What is your mission in life? We have a very short life. And we have to Hold on to things lightly, for this world in its present form is passing away.